Good morning, church family. My name is Val Harvey. I work at Connections, and I also work with Women's Ministry. Let me tell you a few announcements. On Saturday, October 9th at 8 o'clock, the men are having a men's breakfast here at the Chelsea campus. Men, come on, we'd love to have you. It's going to be a time of devotion and then a time of fellowship with breakfast provided. Ladies, we have a wonderful ministry called Mending Hearts, and it is a time where ladies get together and they make stuff and sew pillows for patients who have had heart surgery. Also, if you have a fifth grader, today, after the 1045 service, you have an opportunity for your child to be a part of the Graduates Club. And this is an opportunity just for, in this small group, for the kids to learn leadership skills. They're gonna have lunch and snacks, play games. I'd like to introduce you all to my friend, Sally Dollar. Sally coordinates our Moms Inc. ministry. And Sally, will you please tell everybody what Moms Inc. is all about? Yes, so Moms Inc. is a time for moms to gather, moms of all ages and stages, to have some Christ-centered mm -hmm. time together for fellowship, um, study, discussion. It's a great time for moms to just to encourage one another and build each other up no matter their time, their stage in life, no matter their stage in this journey of motherhood. So our next meeting is Tuesday, October 5th, and we're so excited to have Debbie Copper and Audrey Bond speak with us about mentoring and female relationships and the importance of women walking alongside together throughout the journey of life and the various stages. So we're very excited to have them. We'd love to see you there. If you have any questions at all, please come to Connections. I'd love to talk to you. Let's continue now in worship. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good. good. Glad y'all are here this morning. We're excited to get to worship together. Um, the few, the brave, the 9 a.m. worshipers. Proud of y'all. Um, I just also can hear Clay in my uh, ears, which is awesome. I can hear Clay just out there having a great time talking to people. He's in here now. Um, we're so glad y'all came to worship this morning. Let's go ahead and let's stand. Let's welcome each other this morning. Salvation, Jesus. 
salvation in us. He renews us in his love. So this morning, I want to just invite you to not let it pass you by, to engage with the God that loves you and, and experience the depth of who he is this morning. So let's sing this chorus one more time together.
this I believe and as we've walked through this series um, we've been talking about the gospel being love and ultimately the gospel is love because the gospel is wholly found in the person and work of Jesus Christ it's not a thing about him it's not something that describes him but the death burial and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ is the gospel is the hope of our salvation this morning. And this song beautifully lays it out for us to sing together. So as we sing these words, this creed of our faith together, I pray you don't let those words come out of your mouth empty because they are deep and full of meaning and full of hope this morning. So hear the words of the gospel, sing the words of this gospel this morning and be encouraged. i 
continue our time of worship by taking our offering. So you can find that basket at the inside of each row and pass it this time. And in recognition of the fact that everything we have is a gift from God, we'll close this time of offering by singing the doxology. Thanks, man. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Hey, I uh, want to let you know before we get to opening God's Word together this morning, I want to talk about an event that is coming up in the life of our church uh, that I think you'll find very helpful and fun and interesting and intriguing. This is Fall Family Fun Night. Uh, as the weather is getting a little bit cooler, and since we live in Alabama, that just means a few degrees, and we get to call it fall anyway. Uh, Wednesday, October the 27th, uh, look, there's a lot of new things happening in the life of our church, a lot of new traditions, a lot of new things that we're embracing and experiencing together as a family of faith, uh, and this is one of those things. It'll be the first time that we've done this. We're really, really excited about it. So Fall Family Fun Night, Wednesday, October 27th. That's going to be one of our regular, normal Double Oak University nights, and so I just kind of want to describe and lay out to you how this night is going to look for those of you uh, that are excited about taking part. At 545, we'll have family dinner uh, and photos outside, so we're hoping to eat out here uh, in the common area. Uh, it'll be a ton of fun at 630 for preschool and kids. They'll have some fall activities. There's going to be uh, pumpkins. There's going to be games. There's going to be all kinds of fun stuff for kids. You won't want to miss it. And for uh, us adults, uh, look, we really want that time from five at 545 to 630 to be the time you get to kind of hang out, spend with your kids, uh, maybe grab, grab a pumpkin, take some photos together to commemorate the season. But then we'll have our last night of DOU and students will have their normal Wednesday night activity. So at 630, while the preschool and kids uh, or, or folks are having fun together, we'll have our last night of DOU and students will be together. And the way I worded that made it sound like that that wasn't also going to be fun. Uh, and in retrospect, I, don't, I, I hate that I did that because we're actually going to have fun as well as adults and students. Uh, really looking forward to this. This is going to be the last night of Double Oak University for the season, which means the first night of our second term starts this week. Look, I hope you'll make plans to be in attendance. I know a number of you have been in Ben DeLoach's Sermon on the Mount uh, uh, class, and that's been incredible. And then I get the, the, the humble privilege and honor of, of being with Joe Harvey and Richard Self, our elders. We're going to walk through a class in leadership over the course of these next four weeks to, for those of you that are interested in exploring leadership in the context of our church or just what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus and then consequently a leader because of it. Uh, really, really excited about those things. Um, and look, this morning, I want to invite Clay Ackeson to come. Clay's going to be preaching this morning. Our, Clay, our discipleship pastor, is going to be preaching from the back end, uh, this latter portion of 1 John 4. And look, this is a passage that not only do you know well, but I, we've walked to together and just... Look, man, from a discipleship standpoint, a mentoring standpoint, a gospel centrality, friendship standpoint, uh, incredibly excited uh, to dive in this morning. Let me pray and, and we'll jump in. Father, thankful uh, for my friend, my brother, um, who loves you and loves your word. Father, I'm thankful for um, the fact that this morning we will experience and see and taste and know that you're good uh, as we seek, Father, to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, to, to discover how richly life is within it, that life we live in it. And Father, how, how you would call us, how you would push us, how you would urge us uh, because of who you are and what you've done in the life, death, and resurrection of your son to live out this gospel. Pray that we'll experience those things and know you more in this moment. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.
All right, good morning, church. It's exciting to be with you all this morning. I don't always get to be on uh, this campus as I have responsibilities across uh, Mount Laurel and Chelsea campuses, uh, but excited to be here. I work with our community groups in the church, our discipleship classes, and then also with our men's ministry in the church. So just to give you a, a, a foreview of what I do, and if you're involved in those ministries, want to be involved, man, talk to me afterwards. I'd love to uh, engage you about what we're doing uh, through those avenues. Uh, but if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn, and we're going to be in 1 John chapter 4. Are continuing in the series, The Gospel is Love. So 1 John 4, we're going to be specifically in 7 through 21 this morning. I, If you're like me, you probably noticed that like we're a culture where love is becoming a watered-down word. Would anybody agree? Like, we love everything, right? And, and the truth is, if we love everything, then really we love nothing. Because if love, like I can say, man, I love God. I do. I love God. He saved me when I was four years old, baptized at seven, had a prodigal season through uh, middle school, high school, and college, but then the Lord drew me back to himself. I love God for his grace in my life. But man, there's other things I love too. I love my family. They're right here in the front row. Seth looks like, don't say my name out loud because I'm going to stare a hole through you right now, but my sons, Asher and Seth and Stella's in the back and then Mandy. I love my family. They're awesome. Get to know them. They're good people. Uh, but also during the pandemic, I got a smoker. I love this thing. It's literally transformed my life. Guys, if you don't have one, get one because your, life will, your wife will even love you more because you're going to want to cook more. You're like, I got dinner tonight. And she's like, who is this person? Now I love him. I love him because of this smoker that he's got. I love this man and who he's, man, this thing's transformed his life. I love going to the beach. A lot of us do, right? This is one of the great things about living in Birmingham uh, in this area. We can get to the beach really quick. And I know some people are like, oh, I love the mountains. So, hey, we're really close to those too. You can go to Tennessee, where I'm from, and you can go up in the mountains. I'm not from that part. I'm from Nashville. But you can go enjoy that too. And people, some people love, you either love the mountains, you don't love it, you love the beach, or you don't love it. But the point is we love all these things. I love Mexican food. I could eat it every day. Every meal. Thank you for the amen up front. Uh, we, I love it. I love a good steak. I love a good meal. I love good company. I love the outfit that I picked out for myself today. I hope that you do too. But do you get where I'm going with this? We love everything and everything's on blast. I literally just said in this opening, a smoker's changed my life. And let me tell you how to get one. Probably more enthusiastically, let's be honest, than sometimes I would the gospel in somebody's life. And I know what you just felt, that deep gospel juke that I gave you just then. But the truth is, if we love everything, then we really don't love anything. It's so watered down, it's so cliche, it's lost its meaning. But today I want us to look at this chapter in Scripture and to recapture the meaning of love. To recapture what it means, what it looks like, and more importantly, who it is. That God, we will see in this passage, is love. So let's read uh, the passage together, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, so if you look at 1 John 4, starting in verse 7, we'll go to 21. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Let's stop right there real quick. This is kind of setting up this whole passage that we're about to read. That If we are born of God, if we love, then we know God. And we love others around us. This is kind of litmus test of the Christian life. You know, Jesus said that we would be known by our love. Interesting, right? Not right doctrine, even though that's important. But that the defining characteristic of how people are going to know we are disciples of Jesus Christ is his love. His love expressed through us to others. So it's a bit of a litmus test, right? If we say we love God, if we say we believe this gospel... The fruit in our life should be how well we're loving those around us. He goes on and says, Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, here's what he's not saying in that passage right there. He's not saying that someone who does not know God cannot love. That's not what he's saying there. What he's saying is, is if someone says, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in his gospel. I believe in what he's done for me through his life, death, and resurrection. The outflow of that is going to be the love of God. The love of God that's sacrificial. The love of God that uh, goes and extends to others, not based on our terms and conditions, but we unconditionally love the people around us. 
So what he's saying is, though, if we are born of God, we're going to love in this way. Uh, now, again, a non-believer can love, but they're loving only part of the way. Because a denial of the one who is love is to not love really at all. And so what he's saying is that kind of a thing there. So he goes on and says, and this is love. In verse 9, and this is the love of God was made manifest amongst us that he sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us. Because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in his love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected within us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because so because as he is so also are we in the world there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love we love because he first loved us if anyone says i love god and hates his brother he's a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love god whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment that we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as we look at this passage, there's three things I really want to draw out. Three things this morning. The first one is God is love. God is love, and he's shown us his love in a very specific way, and sending his son that we might live through him. Secondly, we're going to see that if we abide or live in God's love, that it confirms our faith, giving us assurance now and for the future. The third thing that we'll see this morning is God's love for us uh, overflows, first to our brothers and sisters in the church, and then that puts God's love on display for the world to see. So we'll jump right in here to the first point, because we see it twice in the passage. It literally says, God is love. It doesn't say that God is loving it literally definitively says God is love. The very essence of who God is, is love. It's like saying God is holy. And I was talking with Michael about this this week uh, as we were looking at this passage. And, and I think it's hard for us to think about, when, when I say God is love and that's who God is, we want to make that defining mark of who he is, and that's true. But God is so much other than us so much bigger than us, that he can be fully 100% holy and 100% love at the same time. He can be 100% a God of justice and 100% a God of grace. And this is mind-blowing to us. But the truth is, it says it right here in the passage, God is love. It's not a character trait. It's who he is. It's what emanates from him. It's what's most natural to him, is to have love coming from him to us. And it comes, as we'll get there in a moment, in a very specific way. But remember, let's go back to the Old Testament real quick, because sometimes I think people struggle with seeing God as love and gracious in the Old Testament, but I want to show you that he is who he is through the whole scriptures. And so remember back in Exodus, it'll be on the screen, Exodus 33, we'll see 18 through 23, and then 34 through 5 and 6. This is when Moses asked God that he can see his glory. He's like, I want to see your glory. I want to experience it. And here's what happens. Here's what he says to Moses. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And I will show mercy on who I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. And then in verse, uh, or chapter 34, verses 5 through 6, The Lord descended in a cloud 
and stood there with him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So to see his glory is to understand who he is, to understand his name. So he proclaims his name, and here's who the Lord says he is. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is who God is. He's showing him his glory. He's proclaiming his name to him. And this is what God says. This is the essence of who I am. This is the most important thing you could know about me. This is who I am in my deepest heart. And this is how I see you. That he is a God who is love. How do we get a God who is merciful and gracious and slow to anger? Is his steadfast love. It's his steadfast love that flows to us through his faithfulness. We see this all over the Psalms. All over the Psalms, God's people praise God for his steadfast love because that's who he is. That's who we have as a God. Even before the creation of time, this is who God was. Michael Reeves in his book, Delighting in the Trinity, says this, The God who is love, the Father who sends his Son. To be the Father means to love. To give out life, to beget the Son. Before anything else, for all eternity, this God, God was loving and giving life and delighting in his son. This is who God is. He is love. Before he even created creation, Father, Son, Holy Spirit were existing in perfect community that was filled with love. The Father was pouring out and lavishing his love upon the Son through the Spirit. And then he creates. And in his creation, he seeks to do the same thing. And so we see going on in the passage there, that he has manifest or made known to us his love by sending his son into the world that we might live through him. So this God who is love sends his son in love. He sends his son into a broken creation that's been marred by sin and rebellion. Why does he send him into the world? John 3, 16. What's that say? For God so loved the world that he sent his son. And then John 17. That he sent his son not to condemn the world, but to save it. So Jesus in his love comes showering the love of the Father upon us. He comes as the embodiment of love. Right? Remember the passage where he's like, Moses, you can't see my face or you'll die. Yet God sends his son who puts on flesh and blood and he dwelt amongst his people and they could see him. They saw the face of God in the image of Jesus Christ. Fully God and fully man come to save us, coming to pour out and shower the love of the Father upon us. This is what Jesus came to do. In his love, he came to be the manifestation of love to us. That the full measure of the Father was pleased to dwell in Jesus, and he came in the love of the Father to save us. That's truly mind-blowing. Jesus comes to make us fully alive. That's what the passage says, right? It says that he manifested love in such a way, not just to save us, but to make us alive. That we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. Yet Jesus comes and he makes us alive through his life, death, and resurrection. So we see the manifestation of God's love comes in the person of Jesus Christ. And then we are saved and we see God's love fully expressed through the work of Jesus Christ. We see that Jesus came and he lived the perfect life we couldn't. He lived 33 and a half years on the earth, living life the way we were supposed to, fulfilling every inch of the law, every dot, crossed every T, did it perfectly, and he did it for you and me. He did it to be able to go to the cross and to be the sacrifice that we needed to be. He goes, and what qualifies Jesus to be our Savior upon the cross is his perfect life. And he goes, and in his love, he takes our place. There's a fancy word in the passage here, propitiation. And that is where God takes our place. He takes the wrath of God for sinners, and he becomes our substitute on the cross. Love steps in on our behalf. And he's nailed to a tree, and he bears the weight of the world for you and me. This is amazing love. And guess what? He doesn't do it when we promise to clean ourselves up. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us when we were at our worst. He died for us knowing our rebellious hearts. 
He died for us knowing the sin and the shame and all the things that we have done and will do, and yet willingly goes to the cross in love for us. That's amazing love. That's amazing grace. And so Jesus does this, and he dies a real death. He dies a real death in our place, but yet the grave can't hold him. Love conquers the grave. Through the Spirit of God, he raises Jesus, and he conquers Satan's sin and death, and he offers life. He offers life to anyone who would come and say, I'm not going to trust in myself anymore. Or I'm not going to trust in whatever it is we're seeking to put our salvation in. Maybe it's our righteous good works. That we're going to give those up and we're going to turn from trusting in them and turn and trust in Jesus Christ. His person and his work on our behalf. That's where our salvation comes from. His love was put on display that we might receive his grace and receive his love And that that might give us life. That Jesus' life for our life might transform us. He takes sin. He takes death. Yet we get the love of God. We get his righteousness. We get adopted into the family of God where we can find true life, life to the fullest. This is what our God has come to do for us. Because it says in the passage that he has come that we might live through him. So we don't just accept Jesus as our Savior. He's also our Lord. He's our Lord. He commands our destiny. It's one of the songs that we sing, a line from it, right? He's not just our Savior, but he's our Lord, and I'm putting my life under his lordship. That life is found in the fullness of following Jesus Christ. That at the center of my life should be Jesus his love, his grace, his gospel, and that that should transform my heart in such a way that it transforms how I actually live my life. How do we do this? How do we live the Christian life? How do we stay in the love of God? How do we experience the love of God in such a way that it would flow to us loving others as Christ has loved us? Well, he tells us. He tells us in verse 13, by this that we would know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. So the way that we experience the love of God, the way that we experience his gospel is to abide in him. And that's the second point. When we abide or live in God's love, it confirms our faith and gives us an assurance of our future. So if we see this, we see that the Holy Spirit's now been given to us. What, what is the Holy Spirit trying to do in our lives? Well, let's look at Romans 5.5. 5. It says this, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has been given to us. So we experience life as the Holy Spirit is pouring out the love of God into our hearts. That's what the Spirit's primarily doing. He is applying our salvation to us. He's reminding us of who we are in Christ. He's reminding us of all that God has done. He is pouring out this great love into our heart that it might transform us. Well, how does it transform us? It transforms us as we abide. We abide in him. So when we're engaging in spiritual disciplines like prayer, Bible reading, uh, church attendance even today, or whatever thing we're doing to engage with this God who loves us and has given us his son, this beautiful gospel, when we do these spiritual disciplines, we're not doing them to check a list. We're not doing them as as a rote religion. We're not doing them to say, hey, thanks, God, because you gave your life for me. I'll spend five minutes in your word today. That's not what's happening. We come to the pages of Scripture to experience the love of God that his spirit might pour out his love to us. We engage the spiritual disciplines to engage the love and the grace of God that might go change the way I live today. That I believe the gospel, and because I'm in Christ, I'm going to go abide in him as I go throughout my day. I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to pour out his love in my heart in such a way that it affects how I live. It affects my marriage. That that my marriage is a gospel issue. It's an abiding issue. Uh, It affects the way that I parent. It affects the way that I do my job. It affects the way that I have my friendships. It it affects the way that I do absolutely everything. And so how can we do those things? It's impossible without God. We have to do it by abiding in him. One of the things that I've realized in my life recently is that I need to abide better. 
I need to engage the Spirit of God who's already wanting to pour out the love of God into my heart. And so, you know, I think this last year's all affected us in a bunch of different ways, right? And I think one of the ways it's affected me is just by getting kind of spiritually stale. You know, I think I needed some renewal of God's grace in my life. I needed to experience renewal of his love. And so for me, what that's looked like is joining a cohort of some people around the country uh, through a pastor friend in Jonesboro, Arkansas, uh, who ironically does this thing called renewal coaching. So it's just like it was coming at me at all, all angles. I feel like I need to renew in God's love. And it's like, here's this guy, you know, doing renewal coaching. And it, all the whole thing is about how to lead yourself in personal renewal. And so one of the practices that I'm supposed to do this week is to take five minutes a day and to meditate on this thought and try to hear God speak this to me. Now, I've never heard God audibly, so it might be the small whisper, something in my heart, or anything, or it might be through something I read. But here's what he's asked me to do this week for five minutes. To sit there and to believe this truth that would shape my life. That I am seen by God and that he fully loves me and accepts me. This is true in Jesus Christ. This is objectively true, but I also don't want it to just be head knowledge. Oh, yeah, I know that, that Christ died for me. I know that's true. But I want it to affect my heart to the Holy Spirit pouring out the love of God in such a way that would transform me, in such a way that would transform my relationships, in such a way that would transform my life to display the love of Jesus Christ to those around me. And so it's a practice that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to abide. And this is what the Lord has called us to do. Look at verse 16. So if we have come to know and to believe the love God has for us, guys, I'm so convinced that we forget this every day. You know why I know? Because I do. But it says we need to come to know and believe. We do that for the first time, and God saves us, and that's true. But in a very real way, I need to experience this every day, to know and to believe the love of God that he has for me, that God is love, and whoever abides in God, God abides in him. This abiding language means to remain, maybe your version of the Bible says that, to remain in Christ or to live in him in a fixed, perpetual state of love. That's what abiding is, that we are trying to remain in Christ, to remain in his love, to experience his person and work, to experience his gospel, that we might go about living it out as we abide in him. Uh, He says this back in his gospel, John 15, 5 says this, and we sang it in one of the songs. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Do y'all hear that? Apart from abiding in Jesus Christ, we can do something? No, we can do nothing. So many times I try in my own power and, and strength to produce spiritual fruit in my life, yet it doesn't last very long. You want to know why? Because my fruit's not connected to the vine. I'm just doing it in my own power and ability. And I think the Christian life gets stale and boring and all those things. And usually when that's true in my life, it's because I'm doing it all in my own power and ability. I'm trying to follow God the best I can without abiding. I'm trying to do this without my branch being connected to the vine. And so when we do this, when we quit abiding, it gets, it gets really hard. But I've been encouraged by this verse in Jude about abiding. It says this, uh, But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, here's the key, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. This is the work of faith. This is the work of faith, that we keep ourselves in the love of God. We keep ourselves believing and wanting to experience his gospel that we would live in it and then be able to go and live it out. This is what abiding looks like. Coming back to the gospel time and time again to be refreshed by the Holy Spirit as he pours out God's love in our heart that we might go and live in light of this. It's a battle. It's a battle for our hearts. It's a battle to believe, but this is the work of faith. Also, an interesting part of verse 16 says, uh, actually, we'll go on to verse 17. Verse 17 says this, By this is love perfected within us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because, as he is also, we are in this world. This love of God 
confirms that we are his. This love of God, this gospel, brings us blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. But the problem is when we tend to, if you're anything like me, misplace where we put our assurance, right? There was a season back in my church in Little Rock where I started asking seasoned leaders in our church, hey, how do you know you're saved? And you know what they immediately did? Well, I'm doing this, and I, I'm doing that, and, 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 I'm, and I'm doing this in my life, and I'm doing that. That's not how you're saved. That's not how you have blessed assurance. Because what about the days you don't do those things so well? What about the days your faith fails because your faith is in your own power and ability and maybe, honestly, not in God and yourself? What if your love fails today because you've not kept yourself in the love of God and you find yourself having a selfish love and making everybody around you love you the way that you want them to? What about when we get sideways with our fruit? Now, again, we want to see fruit in our life. Nothing wrong with fruit. We can look at fruit in our life and sometimes diagnose that this fruit doesn't look like the fruit of the gospel. This doesn't look like the fruit of God's love. So then I need to go back to the root of the fruit, not just try to change the fruit. How many of us spin our wheels thinking the Christian life's about changing our fruit? And we do it in our own power and ability. And if that's where we're finding assurance of faith, then our faith will wane. Does that make sense? That when we look to what we're doing for Christ as our blessed assurance, it can show us that some good things in our life, but it also can show us some bad things in our life. It could be that we're too dependent upon that fruit, and really we've transferred our salvation from being in Jesus Christ to in our good works, to in the fruit that's being produced in our life. So we need to be careful to see that the fruit in our life is just a product of where our root is. That if we are abiding in Christ, his person and work, his gospel, if we are in the vine and we are the branches, the fruit that would be produced in our life would be the fruit of God's love would be the fruit of the gospel and that we would see that in our life and we could praise God for what he is doing in our life. Praise God for the fruit that he's producing. Be thankful to God because he produced that fruit, not me. All I did was abide in the uh, the vine and allow the branches to produce the fruit. I can't produce my own spiritual fruit and neither can you. But when we abide in Jesus Christ, in his love, through these different spiritual disciplines, through even hearing this sermon today, that it might produce the fruit of the gospel, the fruit of God's love in our life. So blessed assurance comes from knowing that we are loved by God. Knowing to believe and to know that God loves us is what we are to abide in. And when we abide in that, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Our assurance is rock solid when it's in Jesus Christ. Dane Ortland in his book Deeper says it like this about being united in Christ. I am united to Christ and I can never be disunited from him. The logic of the New Testament letters is that in order for me to get disunited from Christ, Christ would have to be de-resurrected. Do you feel that? Christ would have to be de-resurrected for us to be cut off from him if we are in him. He'd have to get kicked out of heaven for me to get kicked out of him. That's how safe we are in Jesus Christ. So if you're struggling with assurance today, go back to the gospel. Go back to God's love for you. Because he wants to pour it out into your hearts. He wants you. If you find yourself like, oh man, I've been trusting in my own power and ability to produce fruit. Oh man, I'm not loving the people around me the way that I should. The Savior this morning has open arms for you to say, come to me. Come to me and find rest for your souls. Come to me and I'll produce the fruit. Come and abide in my love and I will renew you. I will, in a sense, resurrect you. So to find blessed assurance is to have it in Jesus Christ. I was thinking about that song a lot this week in the old hymn. One of the parts I really love of it says this. I am my Savior. That's abiding. I am my Savior and happy and blessed, watching and waiting looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. You know, as I read that last part this week, lost in his love, I had to ask myself a hard question. When was the last time I was lost in the love of God for me? Now I'm looking at some guys right now, and I know this is a struggle, men. Talking about a God who loves us, who's a father, 
And maybe our fathers weren't the best examples of God's love. But let's go back to who the scriptures say that this God is. He is a God who's slow to anger. He is a God who's gracious, abounding in mercy, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness to you. This is who God is. And this is the God that loves us. And so we are to find ourselves lost in the love of God that he has for us. And when we're lost in God's love for us, you know what we're doing? We're abiding. We're abiding. We're keeping ourselves in God's love. We're positioning ourselves in such a way that the Holy Spirit would pour out the love of God into our hearts that we might go and live in light of it. Uh, John Calvin said this about abiding in God's love and what he has for us. Approaching God's judgment seat confidently and cheerfully because we are convinced of his fatherly love. This is where our assurance comes from, the love of God. We can boldly look at the day that is coming, the judgment day, and not be fearful if we're in Christ. You want to know what the passage says? Later, perfect love casts out fear. You know what fear it's specifically talking about? The day of judgment. A fear that God's love won't be enough for us, that God's grace isn't enough, that his gospel isn't enough. And what he says in this passage is it absolutely is. This is where our hope comes from. This is where life comes from. And so we can have blessed assurance on the day of judgment because there is no judgment left for those in Jesus Christ. Amen? There is no condemnation. Feel this this morning. Don't just experience it intellectually. Let, the, let God wash over you his love. There is no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. None. There's no more wrath for you on the day of judgment. We don't have to be in fear of his coming. Because we are lost in his love. We are abiding in who he is in the manifestation of his love, Jesus Christ. So when we do these things, last point, God's love overflows first to our brothers and then puts that love on display for the world to see. I think it's really interesting here that it's, it goes back to again in verse 19. Hey, don't forget this. We love because he loved us first. So how do we love our brothers and sisters? Because guess what? It starts right here in this room. How do we love our brothers and sisters in Christ? Because we remember how much God has loved us. What does that love look like? It's a love that is sacrificial, a love that is selfless, a love that is forgiving, a love that is reconciling, a love that is encouraging, a love that is strengthening. So look at how you're loving. Does it look like this kind of love? And if it doesn't, don't be super discouraged this morning, but run to the Father. Run to the Father who loves you and can change you to love like this. Because here's the deal. When I find myself not loving others well, you know what the root of it is? I can look at the fruit, right, that's being produced. I'm not loving people super well. But instead of me trying to change how well I'm loving people and just, you know, through some tips and tricks, I'm actually going to go to the root, and see, am I abiding in the vine? Am I abiding in God's love for me? There was a season back in 2013 where I was really having a kind of another gospel explosion in my life, just so blown away by God's grace and love to me, uh, really experiencing God's love for me. But as I looked at my life, it wasn't really flowing to the people around me. And so Mandy and I were at this conference, and I was just asking the Lord, Lord, I, I can feel your love for me. Why is there a barrier between my love and how I'm loving the people around me? And you know what his answer was to me? You don't really believe how much I love you. I mean, you believe. And in that moment, I found myself like the guy in Mark 9. I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I want to believe your love. I want to experience it in such a deep way that it transforms my life and those around me. And in that moment, he said, come back to my love. Believe it. I love you. You are fully loved and fully accepted in Jesus Christ. That's a love that can transform. That's a love that changes my love from being a selfish love to a sacrificial love. It's a love that changes me to want to be a person who holds a grudge from somebody and not offer forgiveness to be able to offer forgiveness because I'm no better than them. I'm no better than them and I need to extend forgiveness. I need to extend this to them. I can't hold, Christians can't hold a grudge. That doesn't mean that, that we just jump back into a relationship, though, that with somebody that hurts us. It just means that we can forgive them, and then we can work towards restoration, because that's what the gospel calls for. The gospel is a love that is forgiving, reconciling, restoring love. What if 
the people of Double Oak Chelsea were known for their love? What would happen? What would happen if we loved and believed this and lived in this and we started living it out with one another, God's love and his gospel? What would happen in this place? We would, we would experience the community we all want to be a part of, right? Who doesn't want to be loved? Who doesn't want to be a part of a community that is loving and gracious and that loves in such a radical way that the world doesn't understand? If we start by believing God loves us, we abide in this love, and then we start looking towards one another and offering out the love of God to one another, it will transform our church. It'll transform our church. And then, as our church goes and lives it out during the week, God's love gets put on display for the community to see. Look back at verse 12. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. How does God's love lack perfection? It doesn't. It just means that when I believe that God loves me and I'm abiding in it, and that I'm loving, in you, loving you as a result of it, that's when God's love is perfected. And that if God's love is perfected, even though nobody's seen God, if we go and we live out God's love on display through his gospel, guess what people are going to see? God. Guess what people are going to experience? The love of God. I would submit to you that if we live this way as a church, we wouldn't have to evangelize. Does that sound weird from a pastor? You want to know why? Because our love's going to do the evangelism. If we loved in such a radical way because we really believe this and live this out, people would be knocking down the doors of our church to be a part of it. Our gospel would be on display through how we live, through how we love, in such a way that people would say, i got to get in on this. I've been looking for a community like this. I've been looking to experience this. Now, here's what I know you're feeling on the other side of that. We just don't love that great. <laughs> and some of you are like, hey, that sounds great, but I know myself. I'm not like really that great at it. Well, guess what? Even in our lack of love, even in our failure of love, if we can admit that to people and ask for forgiveness and to seek reconciliation, that's living out the gospel in front of them too. Even in our imperfect love, we can't help but display the love of God. So will we be these types of people? Will we be a people who seeks to believe that God is love and that he loves you in Christ as much today and in the days you do really good as the days that you're terrible? And would you allow that love to change you? Would you try to abide in, keep yourself in the love of God that would produce such a love for those around us that they couldn't help but ask, why are you such a loving people? Why are you so gracious? Why are you so forgiving? Why are you all so self-sacrificial? I mean, or, or even in your brokenness, how are, why are you coming to seeking forgiveness for me? Why are you seeking reconciliation with me? Why don't you just drop me? Why don't you just ghost me? Why don't you just cancel me? But yet God's love doesn't do that. God's love comes after us because he won't let us stay there. He loves us too much. So would we be a people of radical love in this place? This is what the Lord wants to do in us. This is what the Lord wants to do in this place, that if we really believe it, we live in it, and go and live it out, we're going to see our church transform, and we're going to see our community transform. So bow your heads, close your eyes for just a minute, and just ask the Lord, what, what do I need this morning? Because that's what we come with. We come with need. We come with needing to experience God's love, believe it again, to allow him to pour it out into our hearts. Perhaps it's, it's like Lord, asking the Lord, how do I abide? How do I abide and be kept in your love? How, how can I allow you to love me? How can I believe it? Or perhaps it's about, hey, how can I live that out, Lord? I believe you love me. I know you love me. And I want to seek to pour this out on other people that they could see the gospel on display through my life. So Lord... We pray. We pray in this moment that you would speak to us, that you would give us what we need, that the Holy Spirit would pour out God's love into our heart even now. And as we respond to you through song, 
May we do it in a joyful way as those who have been loved, as those who have been forgiven, as those who have been graced by the person and work of Jesus Christ. Lord, work in our hearts in this moment as we respond to your word. In Christ's name, amen.
All right, if that doesn't get you going getting out of this place, I don't know what's going to, guys. So may we, may we go in his love, may we go in his peace, may we go in his presence, and may we go out in his word from his brother, Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.